All right, so time again for my favorite topic, the NFL PA in the CBA negotiations. Um, also, we'll talk a little bit about Austin El- Eckler, Eckler at the end of this and his new contract. But um, the big news right now, uh, the NFL PA has a new president. A uh, little bit of a weird time to do the whole voting process, but hey, it is what it is. And so J.C. Treader uh, of the Cleveland Browns, formerly of the Green Bay Packers, is now the NFL uh, PA president. And Alex Mack of the Falcons will be the treasurer. So um, this is kind of a, a significant move going forward. Um, J.C. Treader is a, um, I believe he went to Cornell and he was a labor relations ma- uh, major. So uh, very apropos, very uh, fitting for this whole situation. And uh, there's some tweets going out about uh, how he's been proactive and really trying to inform everybody as the players get ready to vote on the uh, CBA. And so if you want to hear my first initial comments about this, check out the previous episodes. Um, I talked quite a bit about how I feel about all this. And so we're going to really get into the nitty gritty of it today. But anyway, so that's the new president. The executive committee uh, has also been voted on. There's a number of players that are the same, um, but there are some additions. And one of the conversations that a lot of people have, especially NBA versus NFL, is that the uh, committee is never really any big time players. And so even J.C. Treader, uh, appropriate president from what it sounds like, um, still not the biggest name. Uh, This is a guy that plays center. And so centers aren't always the biggest names. Um, And so there was a lot of that. And there's a lot of punters and blah, blah, blah on the exact committee. So a few of the big names that are on a committee, Richard Sherman, who has been on a committee for a while. Um, Clayus Campbell from the Jaguars is now on the exact committee. Uh, Malcolm Jenkins is on the exec committee. I believe he was on before, or maybe he was on a different council, but Malcolm Jenkins safety from the Eagles. Um, Wesley Woodyard from the Titans was a bigger name last year than he was this year. Um, uh, Larizzo Alexander from the Bills. So some of, some of the names that you might recognize still not any top echelon, but as you can see with this whole discussion about CBA and, Everything, I think uh, we've seen a little bit of a shift uh, from the last exact committee, committee, excuse me, where you got a little bit more name power on this uh, committee. Uh, so that's always interesting, especially when you're talking about a league this big and people are talking about um, how do you uh, serve the interest of the people that make all the money as well as the people that make no money as well as the rookies coming in as well as, well as the vets. And so. I think it's appropriate to have vets and, um, you know, hard earned vets because really they see what's at the end of the rope. I think if you had a team full of two, uh, two second year, third year uh, veterans, then you're talking about people that are really short sighted, worried about their new contract and all that. You want guys that have been through the cycle. So I like that. Um, it wouldn't hurt to have one younger player on there, but uh, I just want people that are, they should want people that are going to put the time into it. And you know, it's different in the NBA where some of the uh, committees uh, have bigger name players and they hold a lot more power. So, but that is what it is. So anyway, so uh, JC Treader, if you didn't see, he put out a, uh, he put, I guess, I'm not sure how he sent this message, But he sent this message out to the players, um, giving them some uh, key breakdowns of what points he thought stood out with the new CBA negotiation and broke it down into terms to understand what it would mean for the players. And uh, David Bakhtiari, who is um, the left tackle for the Packers, former teammate of Treader, um, he posted it on Twitter and... um, kind of lays out. So I read through it and wanted to go over these points. And he basically says that uh, before we're about to vote, this is going to affect uh, us for the next 10 years. A lot of us voting won't even be playing, you know, when this thing is over. And so, uh, yeah, all that uh, goes into it. He was like, but I want y'all to uh, know all the facts. Uh, apparently they emailed and sent out 
um, a sheet of paper with all the categories and all the terms and all that stuff that's um, more detailed. But this, he kind of breaks down the main points that he thought were important. And so I just want to read through these and kind of talk through them as we kind of talk a little bit. We talked some detail. We talked a little bit more in terms of um, big picture ideas last time when what the CBA could be. And so now this gives us a little bit more detail of what's going on. So let's go through some of this. So the number one point um, that uh, Treader lists is the overall economics will be a 48 percent split of the revenue for players, which um, leaves a 52 percent split for the owners. And so, again, this is a big sticking point for a lot of people because you have leagues where the players make more of the revenue share. And some people might say it's uh, fair to have it 50-50 because you can't have one without the other. Some people say the players are the, the, the draw and they're putting their bodies on the line, so they should get more. It's a debate, but it's a negotiation. So 48% actually isn't too bad of what I thought. Um, this apparently is a 1% increase from last year, uh, or the last CBA, I should say, uh, but this is kind of where they at. And so, uh, let's see, they have a media kicker that they basically said, uh, isn't guaranteed, but it, it is dependent if media contracts go up, then they could get a media kicker where, the split could go up or they'll get more money. But again, if your contracts are going up and there's more money coming in, then that that kind of evens out to me. Um, but right now, they're just guaranteed the 48 percent split. So that one percent difference could, uh, you know, represent a very you know significant chunk of money. So let's not act like one percent increase isn't huge, but I'm sure they want it to get further than that. Uh, so, so now this is a big one to me, uh, that I don't know. I, I, I noticed. So basically, uh, this is basic. So I, without getting into too much detail, um, they basically said that right now, a owner, when we're talking about a player's guaranteed money, a owner could put it in escrow, which kind of puts it in limbo in simple terms. And so basically, uh, the owners would have to fund all the money over $2 million. So they could put it in escrow and kind of freeze it. But if it's over $2 million, they have to fund all the money up front. So they can't put the money on the back burner and earn money on it to then pay it off. They have to pay for it themselves. And so the new CBA deal is proposing that um, the number is now 15 million. So teams don't have to fund the money fully themselves unless the guaranteed money is over fi or 15 million or higher. And then it says eventually it would go to 17 million uh, for every team. And so essentially, if a player's uh, guarantee money isn't over 17 million, then they don't have to fully fund that money themselves. And so what uh, Treader said is that they wanted to get this, um, they wanted to get this whole rule removed where there is no escrow, there is no nothing like any guaranteed money teams have to pay for. But instead of that, they're trying to move it up to 15 million. So uh, like, uh, Treader said this rule is kind of used as a bargaining chip to limit players guaranteed money because um, that way you could get it fully funded. And if it's under a certain amount um, or if it's over a certain amount, excuse me. But anyway, it's, it's a little complicated with that math and I'm not like uh, fully able to tell you what it is. But uh, all I'm saying is that they went from a standard of 2 million and now they're trying to bump it all the way up to 15 and eventually 17 million when the players wanted to get rid of the rule. So not only did they not help themselves or get close to getting rid of the rule, they went the complete opposite way 
And now the uh, owners are trying to really shaft the players uh, with that. So that's a whole funding issue. Not sure exactly what it would be, but it is what it is. So uh, next up is player salaries. Um, Treader said that they wanted to get the minimum veteran salary to 700000 They said that they um, that they got the deal up, but it, or he didn't say the number. He said they raised it. But they also said they didn't get to 700000 which was their goal. And on top of that, he said it's going to take three years into the deal um, before the uh, money reaches uh, the level where they want it. And so they aren't going to be able to get the uh, minimum salaries up to the number they asked for until three years into the deal. So it's probably a gradual increase. And on top of that, they didn't get the uh, salary they wanted, which was above 700000 excuse me. So not only did they not get what they wanted, they also are going to have to take three years to even raise this up to the uh, level that would be satisfactory. And so that's one thing. And then there's some talk about kind of where the money pools come from. I'm not super familiar, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. But um, they were basically saying that money that they wanted to go into um, player performance pools, uh, they, they are now having to move that around. And so basically money that they wanted to use for, uh, for certain things, for non-minimum players and minimum players, they aren't able to in this new deal. Uh, so now they're talking about escalators. So escalators, of course, in a contract can uh, jump your money up, uh, kind of like a bonus, but you know, uh, with certain um, incentives, as uh, sometimes people call it. So these escalators, and then they said the money is tied to Pro Bowls. And so they really wanted to get uh, that change because they said Pro Bowls are a popularity contest and it's hard to get a Pro Bowl if you're on the losing team uh, when people don't really know you. And that um, with the uh, Pro Bowl kickers, they don't count if you're an alternate, alternate, excuse me. Um, it, you have to be an original ballot Pro Bowler which again is voted on the fans. And so they wanted to get rid of that, um, but they weren't able to. So that's still uh, in the contracts uh, with the CBA. Uh, Now, as far as rosters, um, they were saying that practice guard players can uh, negotiate up to a minimum veteran salary, um, but they can't do that anymore with this new CBA that they are locked into their player squad salary. So it doesn't matter if you are called up to play on the active roster, you're on your player squad salary. Uh, J.C. Treader said that 32 players last year were able to get a contract above um, the minimum, and they negotiated that with their agents, blah, blah, blah. But they said now with this new CBA, you wouldn't be able to do that. Whatever your practice squad salary is, you're stuck with it. Uh, they also had this weird also, I'm not sure why, but basically it was saying that if you're a veteran without a credited season, and I think they have um, some threshold to say what uh, counts as you having a full season, um, they basically say if you don't have a credit season or if you're a quarterback, with a season, but you play less than 25% of the snaps, you got to participate through some of the rookie development program again. Not sure why, but that is in there now. Or in the CBA proposed that basically if you're not over a certain amount of time in as a full-time player, then you're going to have to do some rookie stuff again, like the development symposiums and stuff. Uh, So... For free agency, uh, qualifying offers for restricted free agents are not guaranteed. So you can get a qualifying offer and it can still cut you. Uh, That hasn't changed. And there's no change in franchise or transition tag rules. So all the tags are still in place. 
uh, work rules. So, um, basically what they've done is that, uh, with all these extra games and whatnot, they've, uh, because the number one thing that I didn't mention, but we shall know they're adding another game. And so with actually two games, because it's the 17th regular season game and they want to add the extra playoff game. So now with that, um, they also said that the end of the preseason, so the fourth preseason game that typically uh, teams use to uh, play their backups and all that other stuff, uh, a lot of people would consider it a bye week. Um, they said that is now mandatory. So uh, basically that, I mean, it's not different except that it's officially a mandatory game. So it's not like you can use it as a bye week and just go somewhere. You have to still go to practice. You have to still be at the game, even if you're not playing as a starter. So they're just kind of making it more official. And then with the extra games and whatever, um, Treader said that they basically lose a week off everybody's off season um, compared to what they had in years past. Uh, so kind of some official language there. Um, yeah. And duh, duh, duh. so they shortened practice time and he said, but overall practice time, but not time on the field. So he said, uh, before they used to be able to have a three hour practice and a one hour walkthrough. He said, now they can have up to a two and a half hour practice and a one and a half hour walkthrough. So it still equals the same amount of time, but they just shortened the time actually practicing. So um, one of those sneaky ways to be like, well, practice time is shorter, but not really. You're still there four hours overall, even if you have 30 minutes less of actual practice time. So here's a big one. One of the last things that's a big one um, for holdouts. So under the deal that if you uh, are a player that has over five credited seasons um, and you hold out any day of training camp, you'll lose and uh, cr- you'll lose a credit season, basic accrued season, accrued, excuse me. So I'm not sure exactly how this affects it, but I'm assuming that this is benefits. So you have to if you're a player. You have to accrue a certain amount of seasons to be uh, eligible for certain amount of benefits or whatever. Same thing like we do in regular jobs. And so um, and I'm sure they count seasons based off like how many snaps you play and all that. So anyway, so if you got over five accrued seasons and you hold out, you lose an entire accrued season on your status and all the fines are mandatory. So um, before. Or currently, teams can wipe out fines for players who hold out. It's probably a a bargaining chip to help them seal the deal. You know, all right, so uh, if you sign this deal, we'll wipe all the uh, holdout fees. Now those are mandatory. So it doesn't matter if you end up signing a deal, you still have to pay those fines. And they've also increased how much a player can be fined for each day that they miss uh, a practice. Uh, so overall you're screwed. I wouldn't say completely screwed, but you're more screwed as a holdout. So they're going to knock a season off of your, um, status, which may or may not mean something, but could be big. I'm sure they like did the numbers and the people that hold out are probably right at the edge of that five or six season or whatever the status is. And this would really hurt them if, uh, they hold out. And then on top of that, you got to pay the fines. And so, again, no help for anybody trying to hold out at all. This is just really making it even worse to hold out, especially with no more uh, or nothing changing with the franchise tax and the uh, transition tax. So anyway, so yes. So um, overall, like I said, the 17th game is the big sticker. And then the extra playoff game. Um, there's no extra bye weeks in this season. Everybody still has one bye week. 
Um, he said that basically this would total, if you're a playoff team, it would total one or two more weeks of practice. And that that's kind of what we're looking at. So these are some of the things the, the owners are looking for. And I said it before without even looking at these details that the owners are about to railroad these players. They're absolutely about to railroad these players. They gave up 1%. And honestly, 47, 48% is bigger slice than I thought the players had. But honestly, anything under half is a slap in the face if I'm a, a player rep. And then on top of that, they're really boning them with these rules. And so it's the little things like every casual fan, I think, is like looking for big rule changes, usually from the competition committee Uh, with CBA. They don't really look at too much like the rookie scale. Everybody was just like, okay, whatever. And I'm like, that's big because one of the the um, the uh, what's the what's the word? The, not repercussions, but one of the side effects of that CBA with the rookie scale that uh, I was talking about and a couple other people that a lot of fans didn't catch is that trades are going to go up in the draft. And they absolutely did because it used to be expensive to have to go up and get a player. Now, hey, it's relatively cheap compared to what it was. So I can trade up into the top three and take a player and it'd be cost effective rather than what it used to be where you had to pay them like the highest player on your team. And so it's small things like that in the CBA that really change things that people aren't looking at. And so some of these rules aren't going to be massive effect, but they are screwing the players again. And they already don't have good leverage. They already don't have good um, terms. And so this is just continually screwing them because the thing is, All these little things that they put into the CBA, they're like, I'm not sure a good language for this, but they're kind of like, like if I had to put it in colors, there's going to be red things that we're absolutely not budging on. Those have to stay the same. There's going to be yellow things where it's like, okay, we can kind of negotiate that. We can live without it or, you know, whatever. Then there's going to be green things like we can easily give those up. These are just little more green uh, contract things that they can give up later. So, yes, we get to take away an extra season if you uh, hold out. That's not huge to us, but we, we want it in a contract because next CBA, we can get rid of it as a way to help bargain. So it's going to say, OK, you know what? We'll get rid of that rule. And you don't care about it in the first place, but now you're giving them more things. It's just small peanuts. And you never get up to the big things that the players really should be talking about. So anyway, so as we get more information on the CBA and it clears up, this is horrible. And it's just and it's a 10 year deal. If I could do one thing, if I could do or if I had to die on one hill as the NFL PA, I would die on the length of the CBA. I would say we 100 percent thousand percent won't sign this unless it's three years and it will go with the terms but it's got to be three years the same thing that lebron does everybody's like why does lebron keep signing one plus two and one plus one year deals because the freedom is the biggest commodity it's a risk but it's the biggest commodity you want to be able to negotiate and be flexible so to me I'm just like, that's the hill I would die on. 10 years, no matter how bad these terms is, 10 years, like Shredder said, most players won't be there after that. And that's just crazy. So they're absolutely getting railroaded. Um, a lot of this stuff is ridiculous. And I, I'm interested to see how the vote shakes out. But I think Shredder's doing a good idea of making it digestible for the common player. And hopefully they all really make Uh, the right decision. So we'll see about that. Lastly, at the back end of all this, um, we have Austin Elkler from the Chargers who signed a four-year extension, I believe. And that effectively closes the chapter on Melvin Gordon, I think. Um, He didn't get like back-breaking money, but he definitely got a big contract. And so uh, Melvin Gordon set to be a free agent, did a little bit of holding out last year. 
but eventually came back. I think Elkler did a great job filling in for Gordon before and did a better job this year. And so I think he definitely deserved that contract as an undrafted free agent. And so it looks like Melvin Gordon is officially going to hit that uh, free agency wire and we'll see where he ends up. But look, I've talked about this particular situation before. I talked about running backs before. It is understandable that at that position, they really want to make a bargain uh, before it's too late. But the problem is... Like at any good college, there's good players behind you ready to take your spot. And the the fact that Austin Elkler stands or uh, took his place and stood in so well and he's undrafted only makes the point more salient that, look, running backs are dimes a dozen. And so uh, I look at a team. And I say, Melvin Gordon, you're real. Or if I'm a team, I look at Melvin Gordon, I'm like, you, you play really well. You're really good. You're worth this. But I'm looking at your team. They let you walk for an undrafted guy who's making less than I got to pay you. And he's doing great work. So explain to me why I should pay you all this money. That's how I would approach it. Now, you got teams like the Jets getting Le'Veon Bell where it's like, we just we need a name. We need to make a splash. So somebody might pay him, but I just, me personally, I think it just shows you again, running backs a dime a dozen. So Melvin Gordon, for all intents and purposes, looks like he's going to hit the bricks uh, <laughs> this offseason. So we'll see how that shakes out. All right, so that's it for me. Go down to the comment section. Let me know what you think about the CPA, the CPA, the CBA and the NFL PA, JC Treader, and how this all will work out. Do you think the players are going to vote it up or do you think they're going to vote it down? So uh, go to the comment section. Let me know. Share around, get the conversation started. Thumbs up, subscribe, and thank you for listening.